loud, I guess. There we go. Um, and let me just give a little introduction um, of Pastor Emmy Kegler. And um, I do, do have her book. I've got your book. I've had it for a while. So thank you for this. Um, pastor Emmy Kegler is a pastor, author, speaker, um, and called to ministry in the margins of the church, especially among LGBTQIA plus Christians. Um, and she serves as the pastor of Grace Lutheran Church in Northeast Minneapolis. She holds a master's in divinity from Luther Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota, and she's an ordained pastor in the ELCA. Um, her first book, One Coin Found, How God's Love Stretches to the Margins, tells her story as a queer Christian called to ordain ministry and how it formed her relationship with scripture. And her second book, this book, All Who Are Weary, Easing the Burden on the Walk with Mental Illness, offers a pastoral and scriptural accompaniment to those facing symptoms and diagnoses of mental illness, along with the families, friends, communities, pastors, and therapists who care for them. And she's a wonderful advocate for both the LGBTQIA community and um, in mental health. And um, if you don't follow her um, online, on social media, I encourage you to do so. She posts wonderful stuff and um, her website's also a, a great resource. So, um, so Emmy, thank you for, so much for, for taking the time to be with us tonight. Absolutely. And thank you so much for having me. Is my volume okay? Can you all hear me well enough? Mm -hmm. I had to yeah. rearrange the office this week. So um, thank you so much. So here's the structure that I want to give for the evening. I have probably a 25 minute ish, um, kind of depending on what, how many tangents I go on planned presentation with slides for you. And then, um, and then I want to have open space towards the end, which I think is similar to what you, you all did with Sarah Lund. Um, and, um, yeah, and just really, I want to let that open space at the end be open. We can certainly talk about mental illness and mental health in connection with Christian faith and church practices, but um, I do like to leave that open for other things. And Linda's already lifted up in the chat um, that maybe we want to talk about the school shooting in Texas um, and talk about church resources and, and plans and moving forward in the midst, not moving forward, but um, moving with action in the midst of that and how we do preparation and care for people in those spaces. And a little bit of what I've got at the end of my presentation will flow into that. Um, but so I will do about 25 minutes of planned content and then move into some open space. Um, do I have the capacity to share my screen? It looks like I probably do if I can find the button again. There we are. Just, just made you co-host, so you should be able to. Thank you, wonderful. Okay, great. Pop this guy up. Great. So yeah, um, what I'm gonna talk about tonight is to give a, an overview of some of the topics that I cover in the book, All Who Are Weary, my second book, but I'm pulling out a couple of core topics and expanding on them in different ways. What I'm trying to do there is, if you haven't read the book, give you a taste for what might be in it. And if you have read the book, expand on some of the core um, topics and take it in a few directions that will still be new information so that hopefully it's sort of applicable to everyone in the room. I never want to just give a repetition of the book, nor do I want to you know, expect that you've read it and therefore you know, leave anybody out. So that's the plan. <clears throat> Excuse me for my hoarse voice as well. Um, I'm going to flip through these slides quickly, but essentially, because um, Pastor Keith already gave a great introduction, but yeah, just to ground in who I am and how I come to the presentation today, the pronouns that you can use for me are she, her, and hers. I serve as a pastor. I'm an author of two books. I also created and still edit the online encyclopedia called the Queer Grace Encyclopedia, which is an online resource for navigating questions around LGBTQIA existences and Christian faith. So you can find that at queergrace.com. Um, and this up on the screen is my wife. She's wearing a t-shirt that says pastor's wife because hardcore devil stomping ninja isn't a job description, uh, which a friend of ours got for us. Um, not that we talk about the devil stomping too much in our household, but we did think it was pretty funny. Um, and we like to wear it to conferences. She wears it when she's uh, with me in places. And um, we're also expecting our first child in September. Um, so uh, my wife has been going through all the joys of first pregnancy and all the amazing things that go with that. So a lot of that is what I bring to the table, but also what I bring to the table when I talk about mental illness and mental health is that I come at the conversation from what I sometimes like to call the wrong side of the table. Um, a lot of times 
where we want to turn in questions of mental health and mental illness is to people who have doctorates, degrees, to who are you know medically trained, who are trained and licensed as therapists, or even who are coming to the table as as the pastoral authority. And I value all those contributions, and therefore I want to make sure that when I'm speaking, people understand when I talk about mental illness, I talk about it as somebody who lives with it and experiences it. And of course, not that people with degrees and licensures don't also live with it and experience it. But I am not, I am not an expert because of research or degrees. And therefore, if you've had encounters with other people who live with mental illness or who work with people who live with mental illness, and what I say today doesn't line up with what they've said, it, it would be pretty fair to question what I've said. Um, Cause I'm speaking from that side of my own experience and that lens. I think that both sides of the table are important in the end or really all sides of the table because we're all coming together to try to figure out what is mental health? What is mental illness? And how do we care for people or care for ourselves when we're experiencing symptoms that might fall into those categories? So, um, Here's a little sketch of what I'm gonna to do today, just so you know how the flow is going. Introduction, we've already done that. I'm gonna talk a little bit about Christian culture and mental illness. Then I wanna talk a little bit about community care, essentially what does it look like for a church to care for people who are going through a diagnosis of mental illness. And then I wanna talk a little bit about boundaries and self-care because I think those are really essential in either preventing symptoms of mental illness within ourselves or also how we care for the people around us. Um, and then finally, I have a Q&R at the end. Um, I learned that from Pastor Lenny Duncan. Um, he doesn't do Q&As, he does a Q&R, question and response, because I might not have an answer. I definitely don't have all the answers, but I do usually have a response and maybe others do around the table as well. <clears throat> So the title of my book, All Who Are Weary, um, Dealing with um, Mental Illness Within the Church, it takes its phrase, it takes its main title from Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, the verse, come to me, all who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Some of the ways that we talk about mental illness within Christian culture can be so deeply inspirational and meaningful. A lot of us have derived great comfort and hope and even joy from expressions that remind us to turn away from negative thoughts and to commit ourselves to prayer, to faithful action, and to Jesus and the scriptures. So you might see that on your screen right now. You can see I've got up um, a little meme that I've grabbed from Facebook that just says, stop focusing on the way you feel and fix your eyes on Jesus. Other people have experienced a lot of um, release and gratitude and hope out of verses from the Bible that might tell us not to worry, that specifically, in fact, tell us not to worry and to focus rather on God and God's provision. So you see two versions on your screen right now of Philippians verse four, or excuse me, chapter four, verse six, or verse six and seven. And essentially the summary being, don't worry about anything, but pray about the things that you're worrying about. Now, the problem is with some of these expressions within Christian culture, we can start to slide into this place where the invitation to step out of worry and into hope becomes a condemnation of people who can't step out of those cycles. So you can see a couple examples of that happening on the screen right now. Again, these are just things that I pulled from a, a search on Facebook. I think I just did like depression and Jesus. And this is what um, people had shared. So on the left side, there's an, uh, an image that says, anxiety is fear looking for a cause. Depression is sorrow looking for a source. Once they lock onto a molehill, they make it a mountain while turning a blind eye to Jesus. And on the right hand, there's a quote from St. Francis de Sales that says, anxiety is the greatest evil that can befall a soul except sin. God commands you to pray, but he forbids you to worry. Now, when people created these graphics and when people shared them on Facebook or other social media, they did so out of faith and out of the belief that it would be inspiring and compelling for other people. 
But the unfortunate truth is that for some of us, including some of us who live with mental illness, like myself, these become a condemnation and a thing that makes us worry more rather than making us feel relieved. We now start to worry about whether or not the cycle of thoughts that we would consider or call anxiety are not only a cycle of thoughts that we can't get out of, but a cycle of thoughts that might actually be condemning to us. This is the last one. It's an image of a prescription bottle. And it says on the top, blood of Jesus, expiration date, never. Prayer is medicine. Take three times a day with faith and patience prescribed by Dr. Lord Jesus. Caution, do not take with worry and doubt. Now it's funny, right? And for those of us um, where prayer does have a positive impact on our mood, um, then they can be really, they're meaningful, or at least they they give us a good chuckle and remind us of the deeper meanings of things. But unfortunately, if these are the only ways that we talk about mental illness in the church, if we focus on only saying about mental illness and our faith, you know, just give it to Jesus, just leave it at the foot of the cross, or you know, it, I think if you read, if you read your, you know, if you really read your Bible, if you get deep into the word, deep into the scriptures, if you pray more, have you tried praying about it or quoting Bible verses and saying, you know, God says, don't be afraid. When this is the only message that Christians give about mental health, we start creating these really negative recurring cycles in brains that already have negative recurring cycles, which is a lot of what mental illness can look like. A lot of negative um, self-talk or um, experiences of disconnect from reality that then become a negative cycle within our brains. Um, anxiety and depression are both self-feeding negative cycles. And I do think when people offer these kinds of ideas, they think they're helping disrupt that cycle. But what happens is that it's adding to the cycle, that we might hear this from others, we might repeat it to ourselves, we then say it to others, and we continue this cycle of believing this is the only way to talk about mental illness, is to essentially treat it as a problem of faith. If you just fill in the blank, believed better, read scripture, prayed more, had, bet, had more faith, you would feel better. The problem is when we make these really easy uh, sort of binaries or these equivalencies that mental illness is, you know, the result of a lack of faith or, or inaction on our part, which essentially means it's a sin. When we treat prayer as essentially and the only cure, when we think of any kind of treatment for mental illness as prayer, when we create that kind of cycle, what happens when someone continues to be sick? Well, that would mean that the prayer failed or their faith failed, right? So that means there's something wrong with them. So that means they need to try harder or we need to pray more for them or we need to intervene in their lives in other ways. And that becomes this really, really disruptive and, and condemning cycle. And it's one of the reasons that people can sometimes not find restoration through faith because they expect faith to only do one thing because we've only talked about faith as doing one thing. So the questions that I try to pose in All Who Are Weary and the questions that I really wrestle with in daily life is how do we talk about mental illness and what are the experiences of people living with mental illness? Specifically, is it always and only a sin? Now, there's a lot of different dimensions to that, right? We can talk about mental illness as the fruit of sin, like you did something wrong and now you're depressed or anxious or um, you have a break from reality about it or the symptoms of it are sinful. If you wanna talk about addictions and isms, you know, alcoholism or substance abuse or self-harm, like that's an act of sinfulness. Um, and therefore the mental illness that causes you to do it is sinful. When we talk about mental illness always and only as a category of sin, when we don't have any other wiggle room for it, when we don't know how to talk about it as say a physical component, what happens? We start treating prayer as the only cure. We start treating continued symptoms as a symbol of continued sin. So the question I like to pose in contrast to is mental illness always and only a sin is, do our experiences matter? 
Do our experiences matter? So for example, I take um, Celexa, 30 milligrams. Uh, it's a offshoot of Lexapro. Lexapro is the more common one. Celexa is a slight tweak in the chemical makeup of the drug. Um, I've been on and off it for about 25 years now. Is that right? 23, okay. Forget how old I am at this point. Um, I've been on and off of it for about 23 years at different times in my life when my brain chemistry just isn't working. And what will happen is my, I can tell that my brain chemistry and my mood are dipping, that I keep hitting rock bottom more often, or that my lows are just a lot lower than they used to be. And so that's when I usually call up my primary care physician. I've had a psychiatrist a couple times right now. Everything's just managed by my general practice doc. And I say, I think I need to go back on select. So she says, great, not a problem. I'll write you a prescription, sends it over to Walgreens, et cetera. And what I experience then is that this this deep depressing, this slide down into this bad mood becomes less possible. I can still get down into the depths and I still experience a wide variety of emotions, but when I'm having these darker times and then I start taking Celexa, I can't get stuck down there anymore. But that would run counter to the idea that mental illness is a sin, right? Because you can't treat sin with medication. You treat something that's wrong with the body with medication, right? You treat diabetes or heart disease with medication. You treat the pain of a broken leg while it's healing with medication. You treat asthma with medication. So does my experience matter? Does the experience that when I am on Selexa, when I am having those down moods in my life, and I'll be honest, the pandemic has definitely been a down mood. Um, and I'm on Selexa and it helps me from, stops me from hitting those lower bottoms. Does that matter? Does that matter to my faith? Does that invite me into saying, you know what, maybe this isn't just a sin. Maybe there is something physically wrong with me. Maybe we call it mental illness because it is an illness, just like anything, you know, gosh, we could put just so many different categories on that, right? Um, an illness just like shingles or like the cold or a lot of other categories of like something might need to be done physically to intervene. So the second question that I, I try to voice when I hear those tapes playing in my head of like, you're sad and that means that there's something wrong with your faith or you're anxious and that means there's something wrong with your faith. The question I also like to ask to counter or to, to voice sometimes what those lies are sounding like is, is prayer only meant to cure, right? Because if prayer, if, if, the only thing that prayer is supposed to do for us is cure what's wrong, then bam, like it should work. Well, if it doesn't cure, then what's the point? But what are some of the other things that prayer can grant us? Prayer grants us a sense of community, of connection with other people, which is a huge um, destabilizing force in mental illness that mental with people living with mental illness often feel very isolated and alone. And a connection with a community through prayer can help break down those lies of that isolation. Prayer can also invite us to self-reflection and conviction to different action in the world. But prayer can also invite us to self-reflection and a, a recognition of our needs that aren't getting met and start providing us with space, at least to admit to ourselves and to God and maybe to some trusted prayer partners, I need help. What if that's something else that prayer is meant to do is not just to, you know, be the, the coin in the vending machine and we punch in the numbers and God drops out the, the Lay's chips of the answer to our prayer. But what if it's also meant to help us look back at ourselves and say, you know, I've been trying the same thing 99 times and it hasn't worked. I wonder if I could ask for help and someone could try me some, help me try something different from the 100th time. So when I start getting those cycles in my head of um, the anxiety means that there's something wrong with your faith, the question that I push back on that is, is prayer only meant to cure? Because I think we're invited to a lot more in prayer, a lot more than just the straightforward, quote unquote, cure. <laughs> um. I also like to talk about, and I've talked about this a little bit already, the ways that we treat medical um, and physical illnesses in American and Western medicine. Um, the majority of Christians in America 
accept that medical intervention is necessary for physical illnesses. I've already listed a few, right? You break your leg, you go to the ER, they take an x-ray, they reset it, they cast it, you do physical therapy. Get a diagnosis of diabetes or pre-diabetes. We make diet changes, lifestyle changes, um, and maybe medication also becomes part of that intervention. And then ongoing check-ins to make sure it's being monitored correctly and, and treated as, as it needs to be. Why do we think the brain is a different organ? Like our heart gets sick and we treat the heart and that's inside the same body. We break a bone and we bind that up and cast it and fix it. And that's inside the same body. But somehow this organ up here inside the same skeleton that can get broken and needs a cast, we treat this one differently sometimes. We talk about it like we should be able to just remove ourselves from it and be like, all right, lungs, just get rid of the bronchitis. No more of that. Don't want it. Not enjoying it. Be gone. And the lungs go, oh, sure. Yeah. No problem. No, we know that we need recovery. We need antibiotics. We need rest time. But somehow our brain, we sometimes just treat differently, right? We just shame it for not improving. You wouldn't look down at your broken toe and go like, gosh, darn it, heal faster. What are you doing? No, you mean, I mean, we'd be a little frustrated about it, but we accept that healing takes time. We just don't do the same thing with our brains all the time. So the question I always ask is, you know, why, why do we treat our brains differently? Why do we think about our brains differently? And then the final question, I think the final question. Yeah, all right. The final question um, that I like to ask is, what do we do about persistent mental illness? Like I, I live with depression and anxiety. I've had it since I was, um, we think probably about 12. It was officially diagnosed when I was 14. Um, so that makes it 23 years of official diagnosis. Why? Like if I'm a faithful person and I go to church every Sunday and I believe in Jesus and I can confess the apostles and Nicene Creed backwards and forwards, and I, you know, spent four years and some, a good amount of money in my life to go to seminary and learn even more about Jesus in the church. Why is mine not better? Well, then that invites me to the question of, of pushing back. I'm like, when I start to ask myself, well, why aren't you better? I try to ask instead, what's, what's faith really for? Is faith just to make me feel better? Is faith just to make me feel better? Because I think faith might actually be inviting us into something a lot bigger than just like, I feel better about my life. I experience contentment and joy. I you know experience a cessation of worry and sadness and um, disconnection. Now, I think those are all part of what it looks like to live a life in faith, but Jesus just didn't, Jesus didn't only come to save me. Jesus's restoring work is about the whole world, about my neighbor, about a stranger, about the, the, the entirety of creation. So what is my faith inviting me into that goes beyond just waiting for the simple fix? Um, these are some of the categories of symptoms that I talk about. So again, peep, giving you a peep forward into the book, All Who Are Weary. Um, I talk about, you know, what is it like to be sad? How do we understand faithful expressions of worry? What do experiences of psychosis look like within Christian community? I also talk about a couple um, different categories like food and addiction. I have a chapter on suicide. Um, but the thing that really hinged for me was on trauma and dealing with how do we, how do we talk effectively about trauma? I think one of the things I'm going to shift this over here real quick, excuse me for moving things. Um, one of the things that we don't always talk about effectively is my screen still shared or did I break it? It's still, you. thank you, Brendan. Okay. Um, great. Sorry, I had to move something. So um, one of the things that I think we don't always talk really effectively about is trauma and essentially what trauma does to our bodies and our minds. I think there's some really interesting um, invitations in scripture into how we talk about trauma. And so in particular, I want to talk about really quickly um, Matthew 5, 38 through 42, and then Luke 6, 27 through 31. And those two are essentially the same story. And it's about Jesus saying, um, if someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other. There's a fantastic book called Engaging the Powers by Walter Wink that basically challenges the traditional interpretation that Jesus is just telling us like, 
take whatever hits come, you know, passive nonviolent resistance is the way don't react. You just, just let, you know, turn yourself into a Christian doormat is kind of what that can sound like. But what Walter Wink argues in his book, and I'm just giving a very, very short summary here, is essentially what Jesus is inviting people to do in this um, refusal to engage in violence with the other person, that we are actually restating our own belovedness. That by not fighting back and by actually inviting the other person to hit us again, we're restating our worth. And the he he does this analysis about like the direction that you'd have to hit someone and it's uh, got all this really interesting um, interpretation, but essentially the idea is if you're hitting someone on the right cheek, you have to, someone hits you on your right cheek, yeah, 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 to hit someone who's across from you on their right cheek, you have to hit them with a certain hit, a backhand, and if that person presents their left cheek, the only way to hit them is with a uh, fist or an open palm, and that's a fight between equals. So a backhand is what people do to um, mothers, to children, if they're misbehaving. And this is in the biblical context. Um, uh, unfortunately, husbands to wives, masters to slaves. Again, it's really hard biblical context here. But the idea is this the striking on the right cheek is something that happens between someone who is powerful and someone who is powerless, someone who is worthy and someone who is worthless. And that's what trauma does is internalize this message of you are worth less or even worthless. What we see in ongoing trauma um, is this, this internalized message of I'm not enough. I'm not enough to ask for something better. And Walter Wink's argument is that Jesus is saying in these stories, you don't perpetuate the cycle, cycle of violence, right? We're, we're going beyond eye for an eye. But we also look the other person in the eye and say, you can try to lie to yourself and pretend that I'm worthless or worthless. But in turning my left cheek to you, what I'm saying is I know and you know that before God, we are equals. So if you're going to fight me, you're going to fight me like an equal. Now, we can talk a lot about the different dimensions of that um, in, part in, in particular contexts, but this idea of how do we create a Christian community, really, that teaches people to continue treasuring their own worth and belovedness. And that's a hard question to ask because we also need to be um, holding, and, and you know, we're, excuse me, sorry. <clears throat> that's a hard question to ask because when we come into Christian community, one of the things we have to remember is that we've often made mistakes and we need to apologize and be regretful and make amends in the ways that we have sinned. And we're holding almost in both hands, like this, this sense of I did wrong and that needs to be fixed, but also I am still a beloved and worthy child of God for whom Jesus died and whom God has claimed. And we do the same thing with the people around us, right? We create laws and we create um, rules about the way we work in community to remind people that they cannot hurt someone else's body or mind. And we're holding at the same time that they are also a beloved and worthy child of God. I think figuring out how to hold those tensions better in Christian community is going to be what helps us move forward as a church in um, reducing the ways that we sometimes might contribute to mental illness, like those slides that I showed at the beginning, and also help improve the way we feel about ourselves and about others. So what I want to talk about then really quickly is what do boundaries look like in scripture? And what does it look like to say no to someone? I don't know about you, but I think the message that I received as a, a, a good Christian is that I'm supposed to say yes to other people. When people are in need or when people ask us something from me, I should be giving, right? I should be saying yes. And unfortunately, we know what happens when we say yes to too many people, right? We run out. We run out of yes, yes ability. We run out of time. We run out of energy. We could run out of money if we were saying yes to, you know, every, you know, you see this terrible, you know, those awful stories with lottery winners where they win the lottery and then everyone in their circle of family and friends comes to them asking for money and suddenly they have no money and no friends. Um, how do we say no to people? And what does that look like in a, in a holy context? Jesus teaches this story in uh, the gospel of Matthew chapter 25, where he talks about, um, 
these, this group of this wedding party, these 10 women that are waiting for the bridegroom to arrive. And he describes them as five wise women and five foolish women. And essentially what happens is the foolish ones don't bring enough oil and they, it would have looked like an oil lamp here where there's, there's a, a sort of more like a bowl and then the wick in the center. And they say to the wise ones who've brought enough oil, give us some of your oil because our lamps are going to go out. And the wise ones go, what? Well, if we give you our oil, then all of our lamps will go out. And there, there is this exchange of saying like, you can't compromise the whole party. You can't ruin the whole situation here because of your needs or wants. How do, is there a way to start doing that within, in Christian communities, within ourselves, within our churches, within the ways we operate within friends and family to be able to look at someone and say, I hear what you're saying. I get that you need something. If I keep giving the way you want me to give, the light will go out. I'm going to burn out. You're going to burn out. We're all going to be left in metaphorical darkness. So there's a couple of, um, ways to talk about that, but really, um, I'm skimming over a lot. My apologies, because apparently I went on a couple tangents earlier than I expected. Um, but really, one of the things I want to talk about is, is self-care, finally, because I think the, that idea of being able to say no and being able to take care of ourselves, those two are very, very interrelated. The more we are able to refill our own well, our own jug of oil, the more we can say yes to others when we can. And the better we have some boundaries for knowing when we need to say no. Because really what you want to do, if someone's asking for your metaphorical oil, you want to say no before it gets too empty, right? You don't want it to get all the way down to the bottom and then have to say no. You want to say no when there's still a little time, a little bit left. So how do we do that? Well, one of the things I think we should talk about is that self-care is about sustainability, that it, that it refills who we are. So I don't think self-care is necessarily like binging the latest shows on Netflix or, um, you know, working our way through. I, a lot of the times I see this sort of commodified self-care of like, you know, if you've had a hard day, you should just have a glass of wine and move on, um, which is true, but does it help us long-term? We got to develop these practices that can help us sort of feel restored and cared for within ourselves long term. Now, what is that, that, that long time thing might not be, you know, oh my gosh, I've had such a terrible day. I'm going to have a hot bath. Well, what if we started to create a system where we were able to do self-care that cared for us regularly rather than just, I've hit my wall. Now I need to do something to take care of myself. Do we have something that is within our capacity that it's doable? Um, do we have something that helps us fill ourselves back up? Do we have something that takes care of our mind, mind and body and spirit? And do we have something that is, is, um, continue <laughs> that we can do on a regular basis rather than only doing it in an emergency when we've just run out of that oil? The tricky thing in with all these questions, with boundary questions, with self-care questions, with how do we work through trauma, how do we, you know, show up well in Christian community for people who live with mental illness, is that everybody's got a different answer, right? Um, I can't come in and prescribe for you like, okay, what, let me see here. What Brendan needs to do is Brendan needs to have um, an hour at the end of a day to go into his garage and work with some um, work, do, do some carpentry work and just like let his mind relax while he works with his hands and can just let the days flow away. I don't know Brendan well enough to be able to say that. I don't know Dottie well enough to be able to say, oh, did I? Did I just look at Brendan and go like, he's a carpenter? All right. <laughs> you, I'm spot on. Fantastic. Great. We'll chalk that one up to the Holy Spirit. Um, I don't have enough, you know, um, let's, let's see. I'm, I'm going to try again. Um, I'm not able to look at Dottie and say, you know what? I know what Dottie needs a cup of tea every day at three Oh five, like just a nice little green tea, just a little bit of caffeine to kind of push through that afternoon. But that's what Dottie, you know, I don't have the capacity to do that for all of you. Right. Dottie does not seem to be amazed by my prescription here. So I think I did miss it the second time. No, you did not, but it's, <laughs> it's four o'clock. 
<laughs> I was just adjusting for central time. That's it. That is weird. <laughs> Well, apparently I should be charging a lot more for these sessions. All right. Um, I'm not going to keep going. Um, but, you know, as much as I can make jokes about that, right, it's it's our engagement with practices about where do we need to say no? What do boundaries look like for each of us? What does that, you know, daily or frequent self-care restorative practice look like? That's a different answer for each of us. And even if I can guess at an answer now, I bet for Dottie and for Brendan, for everybody else in here, what is sustainable and restorative to you right now was probably different 10 or 15 years ago and probably will be different 10 or 15 years from now. So the tricky thing with all this is that I'm inviting us into this space where we kind of have to know the truth about ourselves and pay attention to um, where, what, it, what our needs are and what, it, what we can do for ourselves and then do for our community. Um, and that's tricky. It'd be nice to just have, you know, someone pop in on a Zoom and be able to tell you exactly what you need, but I can't do that every time. So that's, um, when I talk about mental illness and I talk about that sustainability within communities, um, that's what I like to talk about is how do we create communities where we encourage each other in the things that restore each of us? We're not all expected to do the same thing, but rather to reach towards the same goal, which is self-restoration. And then that, that kind of self-restoration feeds into neighbor restoration, stranger restoration, the whole creation restoration. Um, that is my very quick overview. Um, so the thing about self-care, uh, I started out by talking about um, the verse that I drew the title of the book from, all who are weary, come to me, all who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. And Jesus then adds, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I think that Jesus is reminding us that faith does not mean that everything is perfect, after all, Jesus doesn't say, for I have no yoke and no burden. There is still work involved. There is still this need to carry something. But I think that faithful engagement with what mental illness is and faithful commitment to understand our own needs for our care, what our community needs, and how we can provide for the people around us is an easier burden, a lighter yoke that each of us are invited into almost daily by the Jesus who saves us. That's my uh, very brief overview of a book that took me three years to write. So um, you can imagine there's a few things that I had to skip, um, but I do wanna move into question and response time. I also wanna acknowledge um, in question and response that um, A, I talk a lot, and sometimes that means questions don't get answered, or B, I might've said something that in 24 or 48 or 48 hours or five days from now, you might say, I have a question about that. So here's my contact info um, and Keith also has my email, um, but if you want to take note of it and either if you don't wanna ask your question or we don't get to it or it comes to you later, please feel free to email me um, and I will get back to you uh, on my schedule and my time, um, of course, but I will you know, try to give some answers or point to some resources if you have follow-up questions. But all that said, for now, I'm gonna to return to seeing all of your